Thanks, Dale. It's Thursday night, 6.30 p.m. If you're not able to make it Thursday, but you are interested, as Dale mentioned, 32 people have died from drug-related deaths in 2016, alcohol and narcotic addictions. 32 people in Mercer County, um, let alone about five people resuscitated a day. Well, um, was it last week when they had the COPE um, town hall meeting? They mentioned the fact that there are some people they have gone to four, five, ten times and resuscitated them. In other words, they were dead or dying, they brought them back to life um, from those who had overdosed. It's a, the, 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 the drug addictions are incredible at this time. Um, and so if you're interested in helping, either come Thursday night or let us know in the church office, we can plug you in. Dale, thank you. If you've noticed downstairs in the fellowship hall, we're missing a roof, really we're missing a ceiling. It's not because we haven't paid our bills. If anything, it's because that's part of the whole process of the wall stabilization. They're putting up new ceiling tiles. But if you wanted to, check it out because the ceiling tiles are going to look fantastic. And plus, there have been a lot of folks who either help remove ceiling tiles or who have been involved in the process of putting up the tiles this week. Man, what a gift. You can find your giving statements for our first quarter. They are in the um, back of the narthex there. In other words, where Dale and Jim were handing out bulletins this morning. Um, they're there. Please take yours home with you. It gives you an idea of how you've been giving. I always use this as a check to make sure that I didn't forget a month. And um, I think that's about all we have for this morning. Except for Linda. Well, I didn't write you down this time, or I'm just boneheaded. Oh, there you are. Linda, you're, you're yeah, we're just going to move on. So Linda's got an announcement for us. I'm just going to stand right here. Um, Friday Night Fundraisers uh, is trying to get together a bus trip to go to the Gateway Clipper for supper. And the date is July 15th. Um, the bus will leave from the church and come back to the church. We'll probably leave between 4.30 and 5 and get back probably around 10.30 at night. Um, there's a sign-up sheet outside the office. The bus that I'm trying to get will hold 40 people. And the price could be up to $140 a couple. And um, I'll need the payment probably by next Sunday or the week after because I'm going to have to pay for the bus and we're going to have to purchase the tickets. Now, if you purchase the ticket, the ticket is your ticket. And if for some reason you can't go, it would be your responsibility to um, either get somebody else to buy it or <coughs> give it away because I, we can't take them back. And um, I guess that's. It's, so, like I said, the sign-up sheet's down there. It's numbered 1 to 40, so when it gets to 40, we'll be full. So, I hope anybody that wants to come will come and join us. It'll be a fun night. Thank Thanks, you. Linda. Thanks. Did you hear that Linda, though, is encouraging you if you can't go to scalp your tickets? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what I just heard. Wow. She may, that may be a great way to make some cash on the side. <laughs> Friends, let's prepare our hearts. Nope, we're not going to do that yet because when we greet one another with the love of Christ. I'm tweaking you. Good time. Good time. Yeah, Christmas. Yeah. Is uh, there? Oh, I better not use that anymore. Well, the only way it comes from the I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so, friends, as I slowly make my way out front, why don't we grab a seat and prepare our hearts for worship? Okay, 
I don't have it on the screen, so you're going to have to use the hymnal. All right, we're going to have to look at that hymnal. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing? Well, it's supposed to be there, it looks like. All right, so 622, not 662. I know my numbers, no, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. sister ran away because I was slightly bigger and older and all of that and well, we won't say she wouldn't be out loud but anyhow she ran upstairs to hide from me and I remember her running into her room and she grabbed that door and slammed it shut and locked the door the problem was is I was hot on her heels so she locked the door and I heard the door lock I then hit the door so the problem was I didn't just hit her bedroom door when she locked it I hit her bedroom door and broke the bedroom door I went right through the bedroom door, crack went the door. Oops, I'm so sorry, I think I just broke your door. Suddenly the game and the fight was over. There were bigger things to worry about. Not just because I broke her door, but then not only did I break the lock, because I was so sad that I broke her door, but I was more worried about who was coming home. Because mom and dad were coming. Now mom, you had to worry about it a bit whenever things like this happened, but it was dad. Dad was the one I was scared of at that point. Because yeah, that temper can show up pretty quickly. <sighs> Talking about having a big old whopper of a mistake. Especially when that door costs more than hundred dollars to fix. Just because I was being goofy. You ever make a mistake like that? Or even the worst mistakes. Beautiful thing with Easter is that, really I should say with Good Friday, when Jesus died on the cross for us, part of what happened when he died for us is he died for our sins to forgive us. I ran through that door and I broke the door. And instead of being able to fix the door, my dad had to buy a whole new door instead. But the neat thing with Jesus is, instead of being able to fix the door, he changed it for me and for you. It's not just a mistake, 
No, 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 there's about forgiveness there. Where he changed up. It sounds like there are kids downstairs on the side now, but they may be having a little fun down there. <laughs> Either way, I made a big old whopper of a mistake that day. Oh, well, look at that. <laughs> big old whopper of a mistake. Thanks be to God. Then I'm like when my parents who forgave me and sooner or later let me start opening and closing doors. When Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, he brought about forgiveness for us. Thanks be to God. So why don't we pray, kids? Father, thank you so much for how you forgive us. Talk about love you have for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, friends, as you're thinking about what we want to thank God for and praise God for, I've got some um, surprises for you. You guys were behaved so well. I'm so impressed with your behavior. <laughs> Careful, Glenda. I may accidentally nail somebody here. Oh, you mind passing down? Yeah. Don't make a big old walk of a mistake. Don't be worried. I may not be too terrifying back here. Yes. <laughs> Bro, you got to share with them, man. These kids in the back row are very bad. Thanks, John. You look excited, yeah. Oh, almost. Nice catch. Here, okay. <coughs> All right. Now, no, no, Sam, share those. They're a good kid. There you go, David. Remember, share them. We may have to work on sharing over here. I'm just saying. <laughs> so friends we want to give God thanks for this morning we want to praise God for who God is is there anything we need to be praying for Dale well, I'll keep praying for Terry he can't see his uh, specialist until June so until then he has to hold himself together and make it till then <laughs> all his aches and pains and everything. Okay. So that's for Terry Dale's brother, especially waiting to see the specialist and that will happen until June. Okay. Thanks, Dale. Friends, is there anything else we need to be praying for? Anything you want to thank God for this morning or praise God for who God is? Then, why don't we go to the Lord together in prayer? Father, it's moments like this where, where the kids aren't here in the morning that we realize what we miss out. But the joy and the excitement the kids seem to bring to worship. Thank you for that. All too often we, um, we've grown up or we only play around with being joyful at times. Thank you so much for the reminder the kids are with the joy they bring to our lives. And yet we're also reminded of Jesus' words, bring the little children to me and you've got to become like a little one to enter the kingdom of heaven. That freedom, that abandonment that kids have. Now, oh, Father, we miss it here this morning at this time, but we give you thanks for what it is. And also move in us that we're willing to be free to worship you. You are worthy. Talk about love and power that you have, whether it is creation, let alone sending your son, let alone forgiveness, let alone life, let alone with Easter, that Christ is risen, that we have hope for life now and life eternal. How about love you have for us? When I was hopeless, you were the God who was hope filled and hope given. So, Father, we're asking in the midst of this time for Terry as he's waiting that you, Father, will give him patience as he waits for his meeting with the specialist. But also, we're praying for healing, Father. Let alone the fact that we ask that you leave Al and Katie and Brooke and Reverend Bill Brooks and Doris and Terry and Kathy and Brenda and Vaughn. For Greg and Gina and Butch and Sue and Celeste and Doris, for Clifford and Pauline and Diane and Dick and Larry and Steve and Pam and Carl and Leslie and Kennedy and Vera and Matt, the King families they travel, for uh, Dr. <coughs> Jeff Mann, Carolyn, our new bishop here, let alone our new district superintendent, let alone for peace in the Middle East. I almost feel like in a litany, which we just rattle off, Father. 
And so many of these issues and needs seem to be so much bigger than we are. And they are. But thanks be to you that you are the God who's above all things and control over, and has control over all things. And although you allow terrible things to happen, that you in the end will make all things right. Until that day when Jesus returns, we thank you and praise you for your love and your care and how you move and work in our lives. And so we thank you and praise you as we pray, as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be in thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Friends, our readings this morning come from Hebrews chapter 9, as well as Matthew chapter 26. <laughs> Worn out. We're not trying to hide from you there with the white paper. There's a point to it. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of the new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. In the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who made it, because a will is in <clears throat> because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. This is why even the first covenant was not put into effect without blood. When Moses had proclaimed every command of the law to, the, to all the people, he took the blood of calves together with water, scarlet wool, and branches of hyssop, and sprinkled the scroll on all the people. He said, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you to keep. In the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tabernacle and everything used in the ceremonies. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but for the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself, now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the holy most place every year with blood that is not his own. Otherwise Christ would have would have had every year with blood, would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment, Sir Christ was sacrificed, wants to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Uh, Matthew. While they, were, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Friends, stand for you. Sadly, at this point, seems to ignore the incredible cost 
that sin infects upon us. Sin is serious, and the cost is incredibly serious. Thanks be to God that Jesus paid the price for our sin, that we might be forgiven. Forgiveness. We need forgiveness. Every sin, whether thought, word, deed, action, misaction, no action, it separates us from God. And God sees all. The story goes that there was a, um, a the groom and a bride before their wedding were very excited about their upcoming nuptials, and yet they were terrified. The groom one day went to his father and he said, Dad, I can't wait to be married, and yet I'm terrified because she doesn't know just how badly my feet stink. I mean, they, I know they stink, Dad. They really do. You know how bad they are. But in the morning, they're the worst. I don't know. I can cover them most of the day, but all night without being able to take care of them, I'm scared about when we wake up in the morning. What is she going to smell? His father looked, thought for a second, and said, Son, here's what you do. Keep on washing your feet as much as you do now. Be intentional about washing all the time you can. Even use some of those, you know, the odor covering things and whatnot. I know they're not perfect, but do what you can. And then every night, make sure you wear socks to bed. Then in the morning, when she wakes up, at least the socks will cover up the odor. Dad, that's a great idea, said the group to me. I'll do that. Meanwhile, the bride went to her mother and said, Mom, I can't wait to be married. I'm so excited, yet I'm terrified because I know in the morning, my morning breath is horrific. And Mom said, oh, I know, honey, I know. What do I do, Mom? I mean, I love him, and I don't want to hurt him. I don't want to scare him away with how bad my breath is. What do I do? Well, honey, make sure you brush your teeth before you go to bed. Use your mouthwash like you do all the time. And in the morning, act as though you have to hurry up and use the restroom quickly. Keep your mouth closed. Move quickly to the bathroom and then take care of it so that you can at least clean up your breath. Okay, Mom, that makes sense, said the daughter. They couldn't wait. Their wedding day came. It was a glorious event, beautiful time. And the first few nights, weeks, months, where they were married a couple, they put into practice everything they were going to do. Socks to bed, rushed out of the bed in the morning to go make sure that she brushed her teeth and mouthwashed. It worked for a while. And then one night, the husband woke up in the middle of the night and realized that he had lost his sock. And he was terrified. Why did he know he lost his sock? He could smell his foot. This was not good. He threw the blankets off the bed as quickly as he could and started searching for that sock. Well, the blankets being thrown off the bed woke up his wife. She was terrified and said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, no, you just swallowed my sock. <laughs> we can try to keep things hid hidden, but we need forgiveness. We may try to keep things hidden, but we need forgiveness. God sees all things. God knows all things. Nothing's hidden from him. If he knows how many hairs are on our head, if he takes care of the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, if he knows the intimate details of our lives, the things we've hidden, the things we have, and if he searches our hearts, God knows everything, including the things you and I would love to keep quiet. God knows them. And through Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness. Thankfully, through Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness. And yet, what is forgiveness? Well, from the Donald K. McKim's version in the Westminster Dictionary of Theological Terms. Sorry, I just stopped to hear if anybody started snoring for me yet. When I pull this up in our series on church words, sometimes this can be a little heady. But here is the theological definition for forgiveness. Where the word in Greek is sugkorese. Sugkorese. Let me get that right because it's still tough for me to get off my, out of my mouth. Sugkorese is what it would be. Forgiveness in Greek. What's it say up there? It's God's action in pardoning or remitting sinful offenses, which includes canceling the penalty that such acts would have merited. Forgiveness of sins comes through Jesus Christ and is to be the mark of the Christian's life as well. Forgiveness comes through Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ. We read from Hebrews chapter 9 today, which is a difficult, theologically deep passage, one that we're going to give a breviary or an just really cover at this point and then look at further when we talk about another church word, atonement, coming up in June. The forgiveness points to the idea here in Hebrews 9 about how there, there is a need for justice to occur. Every sin, every action we do or we don't do, sins committed or, or as the Catholics have said, omission or commission, every one of them exacts a price. We talked a few weeks ago about how 
with justification. And the ultimate definition for, or example I should say, for just the, somebody who is just is God the Father and Jesus Christ doing the right thing every time. Well, humans, we don't do that. There's an exact price for when we fail. Starting with Adam and Eve, the goal was don't eat of the fruit, and if you do, you will die. And it started from there and carried on that humans have had the tendency to do what we shouldn't do. Really? If you don't agree with me, think about it. For me, the speed limit, mm, there's too often where I look at 55, posted at 55, I want to see how much faster I can go before the police might get to know me better. That's how I'm wired. Or a teen and gave up candy for Lent. I don't even want to tell you how many times I was tempted to eat candy in the house right in front of her. I know, cruel, and yet that's how I'm wired. We don't even tell her how many times I had jelly beans in my mouth. And then I said, hi, honey, how are you? Yes. Sometimes I do it on purpose just to be a jerk. And yet, in reality, when you look at it, should I have done that? I'm tempted to do such things. In the worst case, because of sin in me, where I don't want to do the right. Maybe that's why so many of us struggle with whether it's losing weight or and what we watch on television, how much time we fritter away on the internet or playing games, how much time we may lose in doing things that really aren't of much worth. Because we also know in heart we're not supposed to do such things, let alone for the things that are even, relatively speaking, worse. Whether it's pornography, alcohol, and drugs, and gambling. For some, it's that temptation, the reality that we know we shouldn't do those things, they become even more enticing. Sin is deceptive and slick that way. We do what we really don't want to do. What we shouldn't do, the things that get in the way of our relationship with ourselves, with God, and with others. That temptation is there. We've got a problem and it is called sin. Doing what we shouldn't do as we miss the mark that God would have us live up to. In Hebrews chapter 9, it talked about how there was sprinkling of blood and the enactment and the enactment of the new covenant. Well, that was about the Ten Commandments and the laws that were added afterwards to make sure that the cleansing occurred before the covenant or a word that makes more sense for us, the contract, was enacted. Relationship between ourselves and God. And why did they sprinkle blood? Because there always has to be a price paid. Starting with Adam and Eve, it was about somebody had to pay the price, and if you break it, well, if you eat of the fruit, the Lord said to Adam, you will surely die. The model being that sin is serious. If anything, in our culture, we blow that seriousness off. We make it seem, as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else, it's okay. And yet I would imagine, if you think back about how you failed in the past, how it's haunted you for maybe years, weeks, months, decades, some of the things you've done still seem to haunt you. There's a price that sin exacts upon us. Sin leads to death, whether it's in for ourselves, our relationship with ourselves, or with others, or even with God. In a spiritual sense, it leads to death as well. In a physical sense, sin sometimes can cause death for ourselves. For example, suicide, simplistically putting it this way. Because I do not mean to minimize the horrific things that occur with suicide, but suicide is murder of yourself to the point where you may have relationships with others that are broken because someone failed. I'm getting ready for this week. I'm thought of, thought of many relationships that are broken because of something I did or something someone else did. The pain is still there. Some 20 years later from college, the pain's still there. Sin leaves a mark ultimately leading, leading to death. That's why blood shows up so much in the Old Testament. For, as we heard in Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Why? Because the blood pointed to the fact that something died. For example, as we talked about at the uh, Seder meal for a Monday Thursday service, if you do things properly according to the letter of the law for a Passover meal, you bring in the lamb that will be slaughtered four days before the meal. Four days beforehand. What happens with the kids and the cute little lamb? I don't know about you, but instantaneously what it looks like is they, 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 they bond. On most cases, kids just fall in love. Can you imagine after four days, that sheep has been there sitting right outside of the house? I mean, that was the model they had. That sheep was supposed to be right there, if not outside, inside the house. 
The cute little pet is then killed as a reminder of the way to sin. No wonder in the Old Testament constantly speaks of sin, blood being allowed for or used in sacrifices. It pointed to the fact that someone died because sin is serious. And yet the ultimate sacrifice for this sin is Jesus, the perfect person dying in our place. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 26, put it this way. He's appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. What does that mean? He's the sacrifice for us. Instead of the lamb, instead of the bulls, instead of anything else, we're constantly having to be offered, Jesus did it once and for all. How do we remember that? Well, on Palm Sundays, we celebrate the Lord's Supper here in church. Jesus puts it this way from Matthew 26. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He paid the price for us. On the cross, he paid the price for us. Thanks be to God. Because with the cross, with what Jesus did for us, instead of it being a lamb, instead of being a calf, instead of it being us having to pay the price, the one who paid that serious, painful, bloody price for us, Jesus paid the price. And now we can know forgiveness. So now we can know forgiveness. We know the word, but how's that work? One way for us to look at it is the looking at a whiteboard here. Now, it's a new whiteboard. It's barely been used. And I'll tell you the truth. Here's when we used it. The 9 a.m. service. That's it. Brand new whiteboard. <whistles> so, so pretty, you may be thinking. What color is the whiteboard? White. White. Or we may also get a real specific say it's an absence of any color because it's white. We won't go there unless you're scientifically minded and want to argue with me a bit, which is quite fine. And yet, this is what we look like when we're born. Perfect, if I may call it perfect. Although this child looks a little flat, we'll move on. It's a bad joke. Otherwise, perfect, without a mark. And yet, when we live life, sooner or later we start to become selfish, become self-motivated, to become, not self-motivated, that's a bad way to put it, selfish, self-seeking. How many times have you had a little baby in your arms where it wasn't because the diaper was what they were crying, or it wasn't because that they were hungry, it was because they wanted to do what they wanted to do. How many times have you seen a little one who's been carried too much crying because nobody will pick them up? That's where you get from that point from showing a child love to somebody's act of the baby's crying because they want more for themselves. Where sin starts to sneak in. And as our kids get older, quite quickly you start to see that sin keeps showing up in different ways. That becomes more and more a part of their lives. And really, if we look at our own lives, how much it can keep coming in where we do things that we want for ourselves. Or we do want things that will hurt someone else. Or we start doing things where it's all about what we want. Whether it's selfishness, or it's causing someone else pain, or really we ignore God. That it keeps on adding in. That can, sin keeps on being a part of our lives. And maybe really itty bitty ones. And even breaking the door as a kid wasn't that much of a sin. But as a, as a teenager, maybe 13 or 14, I remember being arrested for trying to break into a store in the middle of the night. Talk about one where sin keeps getting in the way. It becomes a muddy, ugly mess where the black whiteboard markers suddenly just keep on inter overriding. Try to be a good person? If we did that, what do we do? If I try to be good, well, I did some good stuff. But what's still there? You can still see the sin on the marker. No matter how much I write in good things in blue, it's not getting rid of the sin. Too many folks seem to think that just by being a good person, it covers it up. But then why in the world would Jesus die on the cross? If he just, if he just want to be a good teacher, then just tell us how to live and be a good person. But when I try to be good, I'm just covering it up. And sometimes when I'm trying to be good, at least me, I do it for my own selfish motives. I want people to see the nice things I'm doing. So it may be a good thing, but still on black whiteboard marker, it's not so good because it's still about me. We can hide from what we try to do, the sin that gets in the way. We can hide from the fact that we make mistakes. We can try to pretend like there aren't any problems as though somehow, if I just bottle up and pretend it's not there, it'll be A-OK. -okay. So I just flip the whiteboard over. Fix the problem. There's nothing here. We call it burying it and pretending like nothing's wrong. 
correct? Except for the fact, if you and I, when we bury it, it gets even uglier. Because not only is that a mess on the board, but it's upside down. When you and I try to bury what we do, which isn't so good, it's even worse. If we don't deal with the fact that we have failed God, that we failed others, and we failed ourselves, that we've sinned, it gets to be more and more of a mess. Some of the counseling that I've done, and I don't do a lot of counseling here, but some of the counseling I've done has been based on the simple fact that people have hidden from what they've done in the past or what others have done to them. Internalize it to a point where it starts to eat them up from the inside out. At least in terms of the actions we've done and not dealing with needing to be forgiven. It just becomes more and more of an internal mess. There's only one thing that changes this mess here. There's only one thing. And that's Jesus on the cross. And so as I wipe it away, it's clean. Now, is it perfect? No. If you're close, you may be able to see a bit of the residue that's on the whiteboard. Why is that? Well, why? Because I didn't use the wet stuff or the whiteboard cleaner. But two, we were forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. When we ask for forgiveness for our sins, when we say yes to Jesus Christ, what we've done in the past is wiped clean. But you and I still hold on to a bit of it. Do you know Jesus Christ? And yet today, something came up that you did in the past that you still feel guilt over. You and I, we've held on to it. We have a hard time forgetting, forgiving ourselves. I don't know about you, but I'm still holding on to things I've done in the past. As though it was my fault or that somehow God couldn't forgive me. The beautiful thing is the cross, though. It wipes it away. The beautiful thing is with Jesus dying on the cross for us, it wipes us away. Unlike with our flawed whiteboard here, maybe even more so this flawed past you've got here, who still holds on to the things of the past, forgiveness comes because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. His perfect sacrifice paying the price for us. We can know God's forgiveness because of what Jesus did. So if you know Jesus, then the forgiveness is there. Instead of the flawed version we have here on the whiteboard, between you and God, the slate is white clean. The perfect gift perfectly wiped it out. We may hang on to the things of the past, but in his eyes, we're a whole new creature. Maybe that's why the Bible talks about how we're born again, and the Bible talks about how if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Clean. So here's your assignment for this week. Because really, we're going to do it now. What I encourage you to do is that you write down the sin or sins that came to mind this morning on the post-it note in this morning's program. Now, if you didn't have a post-it note, guess what? I've got extras. Matter of fact, right here. There is a paper shredder as you exit this morning. It didn't want to work well this morning, just to be honest. I don't know why it was giving us fits. It worked wonderfully at the house. But here's what I encourage you to do. You may just write down the word sins, as here I will. You may write down something specific. Between us, specific may be more useful for you. With the post notes in your programs, write down there. I would suggest writing on the side with the sticky part, so it looks like this. And then what I would do is fold it. Somebody else needs this to know. I mean, if you want to share what's going on with somebody else, that's right. But privacy is a good thing, too. So I folded it over. You can see because of the whiteboard marker, a little bit of it shine through. And then shred it on your way out. Or take it home and burn it. Or take it home and rip it up and throw it down the toilet. Or do whatever you want to do with it. Feed it to your dog, but I don't think the dog would like it. You know what I mean? Dispose of it somehow, because with the cross, it is gone. I like to hang on to stuff. And that's sin in me, still want to hang on to stuff. Or I like to totally ignore things as though I just flip over the whiteboard, internalize it, and never deal with the fact that I need God's forgiveness. And yet with the cross, that is exactly what Jesus has brought about. Forgiveness. The slate's been wiped clean. The whiteboard is now in perfect, pristine condition. <clears throat> and although you and I would continue to mess up and miss the mark and sin, God is still forgiving. It's no longer held against us in an internal sense. It gets in the way of our relationship with God when we sin, when we mess up. It gets in the way of our relationship with others. 
That's a whole different thing than where it is there against us. It's been wiped clean by the blood of the Lamb. So I'm going to encourage you at this moment, take about a minute to write down whether the small sins or the whoppers that are there. Or if you want to just write down the word sin. And take care of it. So let's take a moment and do that now. <coughs> Don't forget there are pencils in the pews as well. If you want harder paper, there's of course the prayer cards there to get. So friends, if you need that moment, go and fold it over if you want to take some time. No, keep it private. Because there's forgiveness. None of us is exempt from this failing of this human condition where we call it sin. None of us is exempt from what the NIV translates as sin, the sinful nature, or the Greek would put it as sarks, this way where Jesus was born in the flesh and he was the only one who didn't succumb to failing. We need God's forgiveness. We ache for it. We're wired to ache for the forgiveness that God alone can give. And thanks be to God, he offers it freely through the cross. To know that it's all forgiven. We have this saying around here that we're saved by grace. Salvation, it's a... Yeah. It's not a... Yeah. Well, think of it this way. I mean, we're forgiven by God's grace. Forgiveness, it's a... Yeah. Gift. It's not a... Yeah. Paycheck. You and I don't deserve it. What can we do compared to the God of the universe who created all things for us to offer back? Getting opposite freely out of love. So whether we have sins of commission or omission, things we've done, we haven't done, we still need God's forgiveness. Thanks be to God that he offers it freely to us. Thanks be to God he offers it freely. It's been wiped clean. All is forgiven. It's for us to own it. Live life as though we are forgiven. Owning the fact that the one who gives us ultimate forgiveness isn't us or how good of people we are. It's by the blood of Jesus Christ who paid the price for us. So, since we need forgiveness, let's go to the Father together as we pray. And I encourage you to hold up your hands toward heaven as we talk with God. Close your eyes. My friends, let's pray together. Lord God, loving Father. Lord God, loving Father. I love you. I love you. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for forgiveness. Empower me to forgive myself. Empower me to forgive myself. Oh, what a gift your forgiveness is. What a gift your forgiveness is. It's in Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's continue to worship through the giving of our tithes and our offerings. <laughs>
Father, we give these gifts back to you as we thank you for how you provide for us, how you care for us, how you forgive us. They're yours, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Friends, let's sing together. Hymn number 362, verses 1, 2, and 3. There's nothing but the blood. Salvation, it's a. Yeah. It is not a. Yeah. So if you leave for today, may you live life as forgiven people, free from what care held on to you in the past, free from what you continue to do, knowing that in spite of what we do, that you are loved by God enough that He would not count it against us, but instead that we are forgiven. <laughs> on a side note, don't go out here and do whatever you want to do, because in reality, when we do that, in any case, we really don't care about this incredible love of God. As you leave her today, may you know that the love that God offers us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and knowing that you're forgiven, give you peace. Amen.
<laughs> it's all good. I like how this guy. Whatever it's working comfortably. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I should have. I should have just sent. Could have done the original and sent it out there. Like said, including everything in the middle. I don't know that. Oh, you live and learn. Yeah. It's done. That's the important. We just need signs. Still. We're good. Oh, no problem. Not the hell about it. Thank you for the notes. Oh, you're welcome. Fantastic, man. Thank you. I think we're good. I think those have to be signed and mailed. And we're you're done great. for another year. I appreciate it. Thank you. We all appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>